Um, it's always good to see uh, faces, beautiful faces here coming um, together in this manner to remember what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for you and for me, and also to be encouraged also this morning. Um, I know that there's a lot of people that are not feeling so well this morning. Uh, a lot of people that are down with flu. Uh, so please just continue to keep them in prayer. Also, my family, as I as I announced, was well, not doing so well. Uh, please keep uh, TV on the radar and go in prayer uh, so that they can recover much with them and their health. Um, I just want to thank uh, Brother uh, Jackson for your beautiful, beautiful talk. And talk. Thank you, my brother, for continuing to, to encourage us in the word of God. Uh, thank you for the examples that you continue um, to live, whether you be here in church, whether you be outside. Thank you so much. And also, thank you for the camera that you have presented us. Uh, this camera takes HD, HD quality for uh, uh, videos. If you haven't seen the videos, go to YouTube, follow his channel. Very, very beautiful. I'm sure all of us are well of um, the theme of this month, which is uh, maturing in good governance and wisdom. And uh, I just want to thank uh, the previous brother that has come before me. Uh, thankful to, to uh, Brother Mark that has done such a beautiful job in opening up this series, you know, telling us uh, that in order for us to mature in good governance and to mature in wisdom, that we need to fear the God. That is the first thing that we need to do. That is where knowledge comes from, that we fear God. And then Brother Clive as well last week did a beautiful job as well, telling us that if we want to mature in, in, in good governance and if we want to mature in wisdom, we need to continue to stay in sound doctrine. So this morning I'll also be continuing through this theme as well, telling you that if you want to be capable as a man of God, if you want to be capable as a man of God in maturing in good governance and wisdom, what do you need to do? What do you need to do to be capable, to be capable of maturing, to be capable of having wisdom as a man and as a woman of God? So that's what my lesson will uh, try to ultimately um, answer. So bef before we get into um, our, 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 our lesson, I just want you to ponder on something you know, that, that will connect quickly as we get to the to our lesson. Think of, um, imagine if you can, um, if you knew that you were going to die. Imagine if tomorrow you knew that you would pass away. Imagine if next week you knew that you would pass away. The next month, next year, what would you do? What would you do? Imagine you knowing that you will be ex executed. Imagine you being in your deathbed, knowing that you know what, in a week's time, I'm going to leave this world. What would you do? And in fact, what, who would you tell? And what would you tell them? I'm sure many of us will probably tell our loved ones. We'll probably tell them the last words. You know, we'll probably tell them we love them. We'll probably encourage them. We'll probably, you know, um, um, rebuke them of the things that they've done. Imagine that, brother. What would you do? Who would you tell? Who would be the first person to come to your mind? And what words would you tell them if you knew that you would leave this world? Brother Allen, what would you tell your wife? If you knew this morning that tomorrow probably you're never going to be, what would you tell her? Uncle Leno, what would you tell your, your sons if you knew that in a month's time won't be here? What would you tell them? What would you tell them? Brother Jackson, what would you tell known to your newly wedded wife if you knew that, you know what, after that Sunday we're not going to come back? What would you tell them if you knew that? What would be your last words? Would you encourage her? Would you say you love her? What would you say? I want us to ponder on that as we get into the lesson of the day. That what would we do? And who would we tell? Who would be the first person that we would want to tell? And what would we tell them? I'm saying this because our entire lesson this morning is going to be focused on 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. 
our entire lesson is going to be coming from that second Timothy. Second Timothy is such a beautiful book. If you haven't read it, please go through it. Please read it. It's such a beautiful book. It's rich. It's full of a lot of things. In fact, this book is the second letter that Paul writes to his son in the faith, which is Timothy. Paul writes this letter in his second imprisonment in Rome. Why he was in chains? He's writing this letter when he's in prison. He's writing this letter when he's chained. And in fact, this is Paul's last letter. This book is different from all other Paul's writings because this is the last book. This is the last words that he could have said. This is the last thing that Paul says before he died, before he knew that he was going to be executed. What does he do? He chooses to write to Timothy. He doesn't write to anyone else. He chooses to write to Timothy, to his son of faith. Trying to, it's, it, this, this, book, this book is like a motivation, farewell letter to his beloved Timothy. This book is trying to tell or to motivate Timothy, Timothy on how to lead God's people. He tells Timothy here of how to be a good leader. He tells Timothy here of how to wisely preach the good word. How to preach the good word or how to preach sound doctrine in season and out of season. And also preaching the truth, especially the one that was deposited in him while he was a child. And finally also showing him that suffering is part of a normal Christian life work. So this book is rich. This book is so beautiful that if you read it with understanding, if you read within the context of the book of, of, of Second Timothy, you will, you will understand you know, the emotions that, 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 um, that Paul is going through. So as we read this book, I want you to imagine yourself in Paul's uh, uh, shoes. Imagine yourself being chained. Imagine yourself knowing that you're going to be executed. Imagine yourself not knowing whether you're going to come out or not. And also, put yourself also in Timothy's shoes. Imagine yourself being written by somebody writing these final words to you. Imagine how you would receive those words. Imagine yourself as Timothy, knowing that probably, you know what, I have to go through the same things that um, um, Paul went through. So as, as we read, as we focus on this book, I want you to, 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 to put yourself in the scene of what's happening here. Because many times when we read the Bible, you know, we take it out of context. You know, we don't understand the richness of the word. But if we read in context, if we read and we try to put ourselves as if we're in that shoe, as if, if we're in that um, um, scenario, as if we're in that ring, the, that arena, then we'll, we'll understand the word. Then we'll understand what the writer is trying to tell us and how also we should receive the word. So here Paul here is, 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 is writing his final words. We know that Paul has been through it all. At this time, Paul is matured. I mean, we know that Paul was persecuted. We know that Paul used to be the one who persecuted other people, but now he's been the one being persecuted. We know that Paul knows what it's like to have much. We know that Paul knows what it's like to be in need. Paul has been through it all. At this time, as he's, read, as he's writing this final letter, he's more matured. He's been through it all. He's been through all the persecutions that you can, that you can think of. Whether it be shipwreck, whether it be coming out of prison and out of pre coming in and out of prison, he's been there. He's been through it all. He's been denied by his own people. Um, he's been stoned. He's been mocked. He's been through it all. And this is his last letter. This is his last letter that he pens down. So imagine that as we read through all this. This is final, final letter that he writes. And he writes it while he's been through everything, while he's gone through everything. So he's more matured. In other words, this letter is full of season. You know, this letter is rich. You know, for those who like cooking like the brother Ryan, they know, you know, if you cook gravy, you know, you make sure that it brews, you know, you make sure it seasons. You know, when, the, when you cook stew, when the water is about to be at its lowest, that's when it's rich, you know? That's when you can lick it. When you lick it, you feel that, ah, oh, yeah, this stew is so nice. You know, that's, this, is, this is how Paul is at this time. You know, imagine eating um, um, a leg of lamb. You know, I, I think of, every time I think of a leg of lamb, I think of the Bermans, 
um, 10th anniversary, you know, when we came here and they had the speed bra, and, oh, that was a beautiful level of land. <laughs> you know, that, 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 um, 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 that meat was so matured in a way that it just falls off the bones. That's how good it was. I still remember it. I don't know how many years ago it was. Ten, seven years ago? Six. Six years ago. But I still remember that level of them. Because it was so mature. So imagine, imagine yourself, you know, also eating that meat, eating, you know, um, 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 oxtail, you know, well matured oxtail cooked to the bone. This is exactly how you must think of, of the words that Paul is saying here. This is how you must think of of, 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 of um, the word being received by, by Timothy here. It's not, it's not receiving you know, raw or medium well, it's receiving the well cooked uh, uh, um, um, food. It's, it's receiving that leg of lamb that falls off his bones. You know, so this is the words that Timothy here is receiving. He's receiving the best of the best. He's receiving from somebody that is mature, that has been through it all. So as we read this, this, this book, I want you to, 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 to focus on that so that you can have understanding of what's happening. If I had enough time, I would go through the whole of, of uh, the entire Second Timothy, because it's such a beautiful book. But because of time, I'll only focus on Timothy chapter 3. Timothy chapter 3, let us turn there. Timothy, uh, Second Timothy chapter 3. So that's where we're going to um, get our lesson. I'm just going to read through it. But we only focus on our scripture reading. Um, can you please go to our scripture reading, please? So we focus on uh, verses 10 and verses 17. So before we get into verses 10 and uh, 17, I want to just set the scene here of what's happening in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and why I like it so much. I like 2 Timothy chapter 3 because it's where Paul's second letter reaches its climax. This is where um, Paul, you know, reaches the point where he's about to conclude, you know, on, 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 on chapter 4. This is where he brings everything down beautifully. And this is, this is where he motivates um, 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 Timothy. You know, he motivates him as his successor to come. So this book is so rich, brethren. As we read it, I want you to focus on it. I want you to understand what is going on. So... In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 9, which we won't read, I'll just go through it. So, uh, so Paul, here uh, from verses 1 to, to 9, is warning Timothy. He's warning Timothy about the last days. He's warning Timothy about the terrible days that are going to come. He's warning him that, you know what, in the last days, there's going to be people who are lovers of themselves. In other words, there's going to be um, people who don't think of anything else other than themselves. You know, those people who call them as uh, narcissist people, you know, people that think highly of themselves, people that um, uh, are, are inflated, you know, people that always think of me, myself, and I. You know, nobody matters. I'm the one who matters. And all those people, they always think of, you know, what, what can I benefit from this? Me doing this, what will this profit me? Me doing this, what will I gain, gain from this? So Paul is warning um, 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 Timothy about these people. He's warning him about these people that think of themselves only. These people that are always proud, that never um, uh, put others' needs before. You know, these people that always think, you know what, if I preach the gospel, what am I going to gain from this? You know, if I preach, preach the truth, what will I gain from this? If I preach sound doctrine, what will I gain from this? But if I preach what people want to hear. That's what we heard from Brother Clyde last week. If we, want to, if we preach what their the itching ears want to hear, I will gain something from that. You know, if I preach the, 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 the prosperity gospel, I will gain something from that. You know, because what the, the, the benches are going to become more full. You know, if I start making guitars, if I start speaking in tongues, I'm going to get more people. I'm going to get more people. So Paul is warning Timothy about these people. It's also when uh, Timothy about the, the people that do evil deliberately. You know, those who know the truth and they deny the truth. Those who know the power of the truth and then they deny the power of the truth. He tells, and, 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 and he tells Timothy that turn away from these people. He tells them flee away from these people. In other words, do not entertain these people. In other words, do not negotiate with them. Why? 
because they will lead you astray. Do not negotiate with these people. So Paul is starting this chapter 3 warning, telling them that in the last days, you must be careful, Timothy, my young pastor. You must be careful, my young son. You must be careful of the things that are about to come. He also tells them that these people are always learning, but they never come to the knowledge of the truth. These people resist the truth and reject it. Why? Because their minds are corrupt. Timothy, but rather Paul is warning Timothy here that be careful of those people. So let's get to the to our scripture reading. 2 Timothy chapter 10, verse 17. So from so from verses 1 to 9, Timothy, um, Paul here is um, um, I'm warning Timothy. And from verses 10 to 17, Paul here now is giving solutions about those warnings that he told Timothy about that. What do you do now? Knowing that there's this there's, there's these people that are going to come through the, 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 um, uh, the end of days or the last days, knowing that these people are going to come and will reject the truth. What must you do, my son? What must you do? Listen to what verses 10 says here. <clears throat> you can follow to the screen if you don't have a Bible. It says, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, men of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, and perseverance. So after Paul has warned Timothy, he's saying, but you, there were those people that resisted the truth. There were those people that thought, you know, you know what, we can just resist the truth and we follow our evil ways, you know, because their minds were corrupt. But you, Timothy, you have chosen to follow my doctrine. Not only my doctrine, you've also chose to follow my way of men of life. I like what, 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 what Paul is saying here. He says that you have carefully followed what? My doctrine. Number two, you also followed my, my man of life. Meaning that Paul's um, beliefs and Paul's actions were the same. Paul didn't just do something or say something or preach something else and do something else. So he says that you followed everything. You didn't just follow my beliefs. You followed my man of life. You followed my life. You followed um, everything that happened in my, in, in my life. You didn't choose to follow those people. Verse number 11. Persecutions, afflictions which happened to me in Antioch, at Aconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. So here Paul in verse 11 is saying that all the persecutions that you had about me, all the persecutions that you followed I have endured them all, all of them, and that the Lord has delivered me from all the persecution. All the persecutions, all the time that people stoned me and left me for dead, every time that people dragged me out of cities when I was trying to preach the, 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 the gospel of God, every time when people beat me with rods, beat me with lashes, mocked me, every time when I went out and, and in of prison, you followed all those persecutions. You followed them and you have heard of them and from all of them I have endured them. I have not only endured them, but the Lord has also delivered me from them. Verse number 12. And yes, all who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ will suffer persecution. Listen to that verse. He says here, yes, all who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ will suffer persecution. Imagine you being Paul. Imagine you being in that prison cell. Imagine you being chained. You still saying, yes, all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. So, so Paul here is trying to tell Timothy here that it's normal for a Christian to be persecuted. So my son Timothy, even after I'm gone, even when the persecutions come through your way, do not be surprised. It's normal. Don't think that this thing is happening to you only. It's normal if you are a Christian. It's normal if you love God. It's normal if you continue to live faithfully. So in other words, uh, uh, Paul is trying to say that if persecutions are not going to happen to you, something is wrong with you. Something is wrong with you. He's telling Timothy not to be surprised. He's even, you know, it's like he's been happy about the persecution that is happening to him. I mean, he's in prison, but he's writing to him that, 
you know, you must be careful or you must know that these persecutions will come. You know, it's like he's, he's, he's being happy of the state of this persecution. It's like he's, he's, he's saying what James says, that, you know, I consider a pure joy, brother, when you face trial of, of many kinds. It's like he's quoting that scripture here. Because what? The testing of your faith will produce what? Perseverance. So, Paul here is trying to tell Timothy that even if I'm in jail, even if I'm in chains, this is normal. It's not a big deal. It's normal, Timothy. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 24 to 27, listen to what um, Paul says here. He says, five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rod. Once I was pitted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. Verse 26. I had been constantly on the move. I had been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the cities, in danger in the country, in danger in the sea, in danger from false prophets. I have labored, I have toiled, I have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst. I have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. This is what Paul is trying to tell Timothy here. He's telling him that this is normal. I've been through it all. Every persecution that you can think of, I've been through it all. This is what Timothy, or rather Paul is saying here on verse number 11. Let's read verse number 12. Sorry, verse number 13. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So here Paul is telling Timothy here that even you, even you enduring these persecutions, you will see these evil men, these evil men that are preaching false doctrine, these evil men that are not preaching the sound doctrine, these evil men here, you will see them succeeding. You will see them going from west to west. You will see them not being persecuted. But what? You must not follow them. He's warning them here that most of the time, you know, as we go through our uh, um, Christian walk, when we look at these people that are doing bad things, we look at them and we see that these people are succeeding, they're getting richer and richer, but we, who's following the gospel, you know, nothing good is happening from us. So Paul knew what was going to happen. Paul now is, is, is edifying, is preparing, or is enriching Timothy of the things that are going to come. So he says that, you'll probably think that these people are getting richer and richer and succeeding. You yourself thinking, you know what, I'm not going to succeed. He says those people are going to get from west to west. They're going to be deceiving each other and they'll be getting worse and worse and worse. Now what do we do? Verse number 14, which I like the most. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. So you see what those evil people are doing. What must you do? You must continue in the things that you know. You must continue in the things that you know, no matter what. No matter if those things look like they are out of fashion. No matter if those things look like they are outdated. Continue in those things. Even if those evil men are succeeding, continue because what? You know that is the truth. And the truth will never change. And the truth will set you free. So Paul here is trying to tell Timothy that seeing all these things, you must continue to live the life that you know. You must continue to live the life or the things that you have learned because you know who you learned them from. You know, many times we, we hear the word of God, but many times we fall astray. Many times we think, you know what, ah, no, I think I know better. Many times we think like, you know what, maybe those people that are preaching the prosperity gospel know better than us who's preaching the, the truth here. Many times we fall astray, but here, Timothy, here Paul is warning Timothy that you continue, even when you're seeing them getting from west to west, you continue in the things that you know. I like when um, Paul is encouraging the Galatian churches. You know, they were falling astray. They were starting um, in, in chapter one, they were starting to, 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 to follow another gospel. Other than, other than the one that they know. Paul is warning them, or even if an angel from heaven comes and preach any other gospel, other than the one that has been preached to you, 
let them be a curse. So in other words, anybody comes and preaches any other gospel than the one that you know, let them be a curse. So brethren, we must continue. We need to learn from the words that have been said here. We must continue in the things that we know. Even the, though they seem like they are outdated, they are out fashion, you know, it's, it doesn't feel good. The word of God never gets out of fashion. There's, the, the word of God, there's no infection. The word of God is just powerful. It's powerful in any form. But most of the time, you know, we fall astray because we think we know better than God. So here Paul is telling Timothy that continue in these things, no matter what comes in your plate, continue in them. Verse number 15. And that from your childhood you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith with which is in Jesus Christ. So here in verse 15 is telling him that everything that was deposited in you, Paul, in you, Timothy, when you were a child, in you, Timothy, by your grandmother, Lois, by your mother, Eunice, everything that was deposited in you, continue in those things. The things that we told about, about the Bible when we were young, do we still continue in those things? The things that we're told when we um, first, you know, like what uh, uh, Brother Jackson was saying, when we first came to know or when we, when we got saved, I was still continuing in those things. Those things that were deposited in us, in our childhood, I was still continuing in it. There's one thing that was deposited in me, brethren, when I was, when, when I was still very young, and this day I never forget it. That is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. And that was deposited in me by my mother. That you must not forsake the assembly as some are in the habits of doing. It's very difficult for me to forsake the assembly. Those words always ring in my mind every time. I think, hey, no, I'm today. If I don't come, you must know probably there's a very good reason why, why I'm not there. It's very, very difficult because those words that my mother always did to me have been deposited in my heart. That it's very difficult for me to do that. Because I remember there was one time when I was like, ah, mom, I'm not going today. You know what my mother used to do? You don't go to church, you don't eat. <laughs> and that day she would make sure she makes the best lunch. <laughs> you know, most of the time, you know where I come from, from Venda, we, um, I want to know, we, we eat a lot of vegetables there. But on Sunday, that's a special day. That's the midday. <laughs> Sunday is the midday. Sunday is the rice day, unlike from the pub day the whole week. Sunday is seven colors day. So that day you're not going to eat if you don't go to church. My mother made sure. The one day I said, ah, today I'm going to eat. Ah, I saw everybody being dished to me. Nice food. I never eat. She was not joking. I never eat. So from all my siblings, they know when it comes to the first day of the Lord, you must be there. Even to this day, you know, those things that have been deposited to them, they know it, that you don't negotiate. Even what Sister Solomon always says, you don't negotiate when it comes to not meeting with the saints. You know, sometimes I go cycle maybe <clears throat> on the race because I can't, but hey, Sister Solomon makes sure that she reminds me that you do not forsake their sin. So those things that were deposited in you when you were young, do you still continue in them? So Paul is telling, telling, telling Timothy that those things that were deposited in you by your grandmother Eunice, uh, Lois, by your mother Eunice, Continue in them. Don't forget them. Verse number 16. He reaches now the peak of his uh, chapter in verse number 3. He's saying that before we get into that, uh, sorry, let, uh, I just had to read number 15. Sorry, I lost, I got sidetracked there. Verse number 15. And from your childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. So in other words, the Holy Scriptures, like I said, they never get out of fashion. And if we continue in them, those are the ones that are going to save us, only if we have faith in Jesus Christ. So in other words, if we fix ourselves on this Bible, we can never go wrong. You know, in programming, I'm sure Brother Allen will know, there's something called network adjustment. There's something, if you do program, you fix something, and then there's something that are floating around. Uh, probably Brad Jackson will also understand on surveying that when you fix yourself on something that is concrete, something that is 
uh, permanent, something that is stable, something that does not move, something that does not float. So that benchmark, you know that thing is stable. You fix yourself on that thing. You know, all the other stuff that is floating around, you fix them from that. Because you know that this thing is fixed. This thing is the pillar, this thing is strong, this thing is stable. So here Paul is saying that what? You must fix yourself on the, on the Holy Scriptures. Don't fix yourself on any, on any other thing. In other words, don't calibrate yourself. You do not orientate yourself from something that is floating. You don't orientate yourself from something that is bent. But you fix yourself on something that is permanent. Something that is true. Something that never changes. Which is what? The Bible. Never changes. In or out of season. People try to change it, but this thing never changes. We need to fix ourselves on this thing. So here Paul is telling Timothy that these holy scriptures that you know from, from the childhood, the Old Testament that some people don't even want to read anymore, fix yourself on these, on these things because it never changes. Um, I like what, what Brother Jackson said in the beginning, that most of the time when we work together, you know, there's a, uh, with our other colleagues, we try you know, to, 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 uh, to understand why they, you know, in, 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 um, in their faith. And there's this brother that we try to speak to, speak to you know. Um, cutting the long story short, um, he, every time you mention the Bible, you say, ah, no, don't tell me about the Bible. He's a Christian, but he says, no, you can't, we can't open the Bible. Every time you say, no, let's open the Bible, say, ah, no. You know, not everything is in the Bible. There's things that came after the Bible. So in other words, he's saying this is not perfect. In other words, he's saying this thing is not fixed. He said that this other revelation. He said, no, but let's, let's open the book because this is the blueprint. He does not want to open the, 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 the Bible. He said, my pastor says every time. But he doesn't say the book of the, 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 the Bible says. You know, he's following what his itching ears want to hear. He says, my pastor says A, B, C, D. But we who follow the Bible, we fix ourselves on this thing because it never changes. This is the blueprint. This is the thing that we follow. But other people, they don't follow the Bible, but they still call themselves Christians. They say there's some other revelation that came after Jesus Christ. And from those people, and from those people, we need to turn away from them. How can you entertain or how can you negotiate, negotiate with someone who does not want to open the Bible? Without any reference, how do you take to that person? You just stay away from them. Because you've done your part, but you stay away from them. Because without the Bible, what reference do we have? So in verse number 16 here, he's telling Timothy that why should you fix yourself on the Holy Spirit? He's answering the question, the ultimate question of that, why do you need to fix yourself in the Holy Scriptures? He says that because all Scriptures are given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So in other words, you are fixing yourself on this Bible because it's what? It's God breathed. In other words, all the scriptures, whether it be the Old Testament or whether it be the New Testament, it comes from God. It was inspired by God. These people didn't just wake up and write the scriptures and say, what do I write about today? Mm, let's write about love today. No, they didn't just wake up and say, let me write about that. It was all inspirational from God. So we fix ourselves on this thing because we know that this is not coming from a person, but this is coming from God. So Paul is telling Timothy here that whatever happens, fix yourself on the Holy Scriptures. Whether it be the Old Testament or the New Testament, all Scriptures are God's breath. In other words, they come from God and they were inspired through his um, servant. In fact, Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, 21, saying that knowing this, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So these men, they spoke as they were moved by the Spirit within them. They didn't speak because of their own accords. So when we read the Bible, we must understand that this is the book of God. It's not coming from another person. All scriptures is God's breath. Whether it be the history, whether it be the poems, all of them. These people didn't just wake up and write songs or songs. It comes from the inspiration of God. Verse number 17, he concludes and says that that every man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped 
for every good work. So you see that you knowing these scriptures, if you fix yourself on these scriptures, you will be lacking in nothing. Timothy, my students, Timothy, my succeeder or my successor, you need to know the Bible. You need to know the Holy Scriptures. You need to know that this is the only thing that will make you wise. Nothing else will make you wise. If you want to correct someone, if you want to rebuke someone, if you want to encourage someone, if you want to edify someone, you use this. You don't use what you think, Timothy. That is the last words that Timothy, uh, that um, Paul is trying to tell Timothy here. Is that if you want to be capable, if you want to be a man of God, or woman of God who is capable of maturing in good governance and wisdom, you need to follow the Bible. You need to follow everything and fix yourself on the Bible because it's from God. And we know, brethren, that like Paul, there's a lot of times that we're going to be persecuted in our lives, but let us never, let us never forsake the word of God. And let, let us always try to fight the good fight. And most importantly, let us always try to keep the faith. That is the most important thing. And we have had this time and time from Brother Ryan, from myself, that the, 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 the devil wants to take your faith away. If he gets that, it's done. So we must try that we fight. I like what Paul says that he says, he has fought a good fight. Yes, he's concluding the verse of the book. He says, he has fought a good fight. He doesn't say that he has won the fight. He says that he has fought a good fight. In other words, there's some battles that he probably lost. There's some people that he wanted to reach to that rejected the way. But he still fought the good fight. And finally, what did he do? He kept the faith. Even those people rejected him, he still kept the faith. Even when the persecutions come, came through him, he still kept the faith. Even if he was in and out of prison, he still kept the faith. So let us continue, brethren. If we want to indeed mature in good governance and wisdom, let us continue to do what our brother Mark told us to do. We need to continue to fear God, to fear His word. And let us continue to do what brother Clive as well told us, that we must continue to stay in sound doctrine. And we will, and we can be assured like Paul, that our crown of righteousness is going to await us on the day of judgment. I hope that this has been uh, edifying to, to all of us, and I hope that we'll take it home, and we hope that we'll learn uh, from the words that have been said. Thank you.